Good morning and welcome to the Pastor's Corner. This is your host, Pastor Wayne Breaker, bringing you the Pastor's Corner, the inspired word of God, I do believe. This morning we're going to study the 10th chapter of Genesis. So get on the phone, call your family, friends, and loved ones, and tell them the Pastor's Corner is on the air. But first, a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to present the word to your people in a biblical way. In Jesus' name, I pray that they will inculcate this, they will uh, ingest it, digest it, and it will bring forth much fruit in their hearts. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. <clears throat> now, for the past several weeks, we have been steady race in the Bible. There is no word for race in the Bible. The Bible does not speak of race. This came uh, during the Renaissance. And after the Renaissance, in the Enlightenment period, under people like Martin Luther and uh, like Charles Darwin and other people, Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler, Nietzsche, and all of those guys brought race and saw racial differentiation between the people of God. God, in the Bible, said we are one people. There is one God. There is one body. There is one baptism. Then why all of these denominations? Somebody said denominations is a result of uh, people who could not get along in seminary. And I do believe that there are almost all kinds of denominations, isms, and what have you. When, you, when we get to heaven, we're going to find out that very few of us was right, and uh, some of us were right in some things, and other things we were wrong in. So on the question of race, this uh, typifies the 21st century, especially the 20th and 21st century. What is race? Someone said that is no racial differentiation. The only racial differentiation is about four tenths. Everybody on this planet is 99.6 tenth percent alike. Dr. B. Wayne Hopkins, the vice president of Moody Bible Institute, used to always tell me that, Wayne, there's only four tenths of a percent difference in all the people of this earth from the furthest point north to the farthest point south. And the table of nations, we're going to set the table of nations uh, this morning, but let me first give you some background on Genesis chapter 10. The table of nations is for all time, so that if somebody get big head and want to claim racial superiority, all you got to do is go to Genesis 10 and you can disprove that false theory and false philosophy. Every one of us came from Noah's three sons, one of them. We don't know which. I, 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 am, I look more like a Hamite because Hamites are a fair dog. But I could be a Japhetite mixed in there because they all mixed. They were all together, you see. And so Walter McCurry, did the best thing, wrote the best book on the table of nations. I, and I advise you to get this book by Walter McCray. He did the best exegesis of Genesis 10 I have ever seen. And there's another book by Arthur Constance. Arthur Constance uh, is a white uh, Canadian PhD. And he wondered why is it that uh, civilization seems to come in three parts. Uh, technology, uh, philosophy, and the priesthood. And so he made an inquiry into why this occurred. And he found that Ham is the father of all civilization. Shem had the priesthood. Shem's duty was to go out and evangelize the world. And Japheth was to take Ham's civilization uh, through Shem and spread out the gospel and civilization to the entire world. There's another book, Ruins of Empires by Constance
Francois de Valnay. The Runs of Empire. And he stated that there are people with frizzled hair, uh, woolly hair, sable skin, who is now discouraged by the people and looked down on by the people in the world, uh, set on course the foundation of all civilization by observing nature. He was talking about the African. And they tried to make Francois de Valnay take that out, but he did not. He would not have print unless it stayed in. Thank God for men like Francois de Valnay, Arthur Constant, and others. Gerald Massey wrote a book, Ancient Egypt, The Light of the World Today. And one of his quotes was that when the light of old Ham went out, talking about Egypt, he said a great light of civilization went out. That light in Egypt was extinguished uh, around A.D. 100 when the Christians came in not knowing what they were doing and destroyed over four million books. These books would have uh, been useful for today, but they considered them pagan and they destroyed over four million in the libraries all over Africa. That was another, uh, Jeff Master, by the way, was a white scholar. Uh, that was another person named Godfrey Higgins. He was a white scholar too. And he wrote a book called Anaclipses. In that book, uh, he stated, he made an inquiry into races, ethnicities, and religions from all over the world. And uh, he found out that the Chaldeans, the biblical Chaldeans, he hated to say it. Uh, he, matter of fact, he said, I hate to say that they were Negro. So the thing about it, we have the uh, we're under the premises now that the African has never done anything. This is not true, my beloved. The Africans started all civilization. The Africans were the progenitors of all the people in the earth. Everybody on this earth started out as an African. These were men who looked truth in the eye and did not blame. Thank God for people like God Higgins, Gerald Massey. Arthur Constant, Francois de Bonnet, and our contemporary Walter McCray. Now the table of nations in Genesis 10 starts with Japheth. Who is Japheth? Japheth is the father of all European nations. He is the father of the Germans, Scandinavians, Frenchmen, Britons, and others in Europe. His descendants went and sailed in the far north. And everybody at the Tower of Babel was one. And everybody at the Tower of Babel was of the same color, the same mind, they had the same go, they were of the same speech. It was there that God began to change uh, the races. God didn't do it, but the environment did. Uh, Shem stayed and went in what is now called the Middle East. Ham went down south in Africa, Babylon, and up around southern Asia, and what have you. Also, there are some instances and proof that the, the Europeans were settled by Ham. was in Europe uh, at the same time that he was in Africa. But anyway, the environment gave them their skin color and also gave them their temperament. His descendants, the fifth sentence, settled in the far north. Now, in Genesis 10, it said, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were born sons after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, which is Germany, and Magog, and Madad, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, which uh, lingual uh, experts believe that this is Moscow, Meshach, and Taurus, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Rephah, and Tobama. Now these are the sons of uh, Japheth, and they sailed in the far north. The environment gave them their skin complexion, but it also gave them their temperament uh, as well. Japheth went to the far north. So they are 
the children of, uh, that developed from the ice. And Ham's descendants went down in Africa. Ham's descendants developed from the sun. So they are the people of the sun. Shem's descendants were settled in the desert. So they are people of the sand. One of the prophecies in this Bible, as you find later on, uh, is, is that uh, Shem's descendants, his hand would be against every man's hand. Now, this is true today. Whose hand, I ask you, is against every man's hand in today's world? The Arabs, uh, of course, uh, they are the one who sell in the Middle East, they got most of the oil, and their hand is against every man's hand. The Bible is true in all of its parts. Now, the meaning of Shem, as uh, we can see, let's skip over uh, to Genesis, uh, the 10th chapter, verse 21. Unto Shem, also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born, the children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Apaset, Lud, and Aram. You see, Shem is unique in the Bible and that some of his descendants were white. However, some of them were black, which we can prove through word. The etymology of words can prove that Shem had both sons. Well, if Christ had come through a white line, then white people could brag. We are the superior race of the race, but God did not do that. God came through a mulatto race. Shem's name means dusky. Dusky, because his descendants are black, white, uh, more representative of Shem's descendants are mulattoes, and, and so that sells it. From the beginning, God wanted the world to know that the sons of Noah represented all the cultures of the earth, and so it does. Ham, civilization in the beginning. He started all civilization. He started the old Mex civilization in Mexico. His, his descendants did. Uh, the Hemiritic civilization in Arabia. Uh, the Kushite civilization in Africa. The Egyptian civilization in Egypt. And later on, he started the Mozambique civilization down in Mozambique and the Efe civilization in Nigeria. Uh, as well as the benign civilization, and so many other civilizations, the Chadian uh, civilization, Timbuktu civilization, civilization in Mali. Almost every month, uh, the archaeologists stay turned up an ancient uh, civilization in Africa. So who can say that the African has never done anything? This is what you have been taught and what I have been taught, but it's not true. Now, in the, they had two models of history. The ancient model uh, that was before the Enlightenment, before the 1700, 1600s. And great scholars like Herodotus, the Grecian, said that they went to Africa to study. They said that the gods were in Africa. They met there once a year. So uh, Greece, Rome, got all of its gods from Africa. Uh, but then it changed, you see, after uh, the 1800s, Charles Darwin searching for what he thought was the survival of the fittest, searching for what he thought that man came from monkeys, and he started a hell-fired uh, philosophy that man came from animals. Let me ask you this, do you see man now coming from anything even closely, remotely, that resembles an animal? If man is an animal, then uh, he has a right uh, not to worship God because God would be lying saying uh, that he came from something that he did not come from. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, cre created he them. So man is, a, is in the image of God. And the Bible says, he who destroys man's life, 
his life shall be destroyed. He who sheds man's blood, his blood shall be destroyed. Almost giving us an option for the death penalty. Now, the Tower of Babel, uh, we come to this in uh, Genesis, the 11th chapter. The earth was of one language and one speech. So everybody was the same. There was no differentiation in color. Everybody probably was the original color, which is uh, black. A man was born black with a dark hue. We know this because uh, albinos produce nothing but albinos. Black folk produce white, uh, black, and every other color in between. We know this because you can see an albino that's purely white and has black features. The Tower of a, a Babel and its effect, the one race principle. It also had the one gold principle. In this Tower of Babel, uh, you have the one speech principle. The whole earth was a one speech because the people was one. Now, racial differentiation had not started at that time. It would when they each son took their particular environment. All spoke the same language. All was of the same color. So the Lord knew the dynamic power of, uh, of, of the potential of man. And he scattered them abroad. He said, okay, Japheth, take your tribe and you go north. Ham, uh, you the people of the sun, you go south. And then Shem, you stay in the midst of your brothers where you can spread the evangelistic gospel and my message. And so it was so. Now, we know this. Arthur Custis in his book, Noah's Three Sons, said the Finns have the same color as the Norwegians, Swedes, and Danes. However, they speak a Hermitic language. Now, how did uh, the Finns, who spoke, to, who speaks a, a Hermitic language, get up north around the Norwegians, the Danes, and the Swedes, but of a different language? See, we can we can also trace people where they went and what what they were, what tribe they came from, from the language they. They spoke. There are three promises in the Abrahamic covenant. Let's, let's go on to uh, the 12th chapter of Genesis. Now, what was supposed to happen is the Semites had the promise to evangelize the world. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 has three primary promises. Let now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of that country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. And God did make of Abraham a great nation, and thou shalt be a blessing. There are three promises inherent in this particular verse. First, I will make of thee a great nation. And he did. There was a great nation, and Israel was a great nation, and still is a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. Everybody on this earth has heard of the greatness of Abraham. His name goes back to the third millennial uh, BC. And his descendants are still living today. And the name Jesus uh, for Abraham will stand throughout eternity. He has a great name. And thou shalt be a blessing. Now, uh, he didn't say he would make uh, his seeds great. But he said he will bless his seed. That was Christ, you see. In Galatians, uh, Paul makes it clear not to seeds. Not to his seed. If he had said seed, that meant that all Israel uh, would have been a blessing to this uh, world. But he said, Thy seed I will make great. Well, then uh, we, we look at racial differentiation and what have you. Let's go over to the 25th chapter of uh, Genesis. 
Then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. You see, Keturah was his second wife, his third wife, excuse me. His, he first married Sarah, Sarah, his sister, and then uh, Sarah <laughs> got an assassin and she gave her husband uh, Hagar, her handmaid, her concubine, her, her nurse, her, her uh, servant. And so uh, Hagar bore Abraham a son. Well, you know how uh, a uh, woman got jealous <laughs> of another woman having a child for her husband. Uh, you can't blame her for that. And then she ran Hagar away. Hagar prayed. The Lord told her to go back. She went back and uh, finally Sarah had a son. Well, the bond's uh, servant's son, Ishmael, began to mock the true heir. And uh, Sarah went and told Abraham to cast out the bond woman. And so Abraham, sad to say, had to take his seed, uh, Ishmael, his 12-year-old son, and turn him loose in the wilderness. However, God made a promise that he would bless uh, Ishmael. And so Ishmael is really the father of the Arab people that dwelt in the desert. Now, uh, what I'm getting at is that uh, Ishmael is from an African woman, you see. And later on, I guess, when uh, Hagar died, I know Sarah had died, he took another woman, a Canaanite woman. Her name was Keturah. And the 25th chapter of Genesis says, then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. Uh, this is Genesis, the 25th chapter, and the first verse. And she bare him Zemran, and Jachan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. Well, Midian, who was from the tribe of Midian? Uh, Zipporah, Moses' wife. And the Bible says she was a Cushite, which means that in Shem's uh, line, a Cushite says, well, Cush in the Bible means black. And so uh, half of these uh, people born in the Keturah, if not all of them, were black. We know it. And it also mentioned that uh, Kedar, uh, Kedar, Kida means black. Uh, the, uh, the curtains of Kida uh, means black. So my point is that all through this Bible, God didn't curse anyone. He didn't differentiate according to color. He didn't favor anybody according to their color. Neither should we today. The Bible says that there is neither male nor female in the body of Christ, but all of one. What does that mean? It means that you have uh, equal privileges. As John Piper said in his book, Man and Woman, in Biblical Perspective, equal privileges for different roles. Now, I'm going to be careful about what I say about this, but sometimes churches distinguish between male and female in the body of Christ. Some churches believe in women pastors. Others churches do not believe in, in women pastors. But however you cast it, uh, there are uh, the same privilege in the body of Christ, but different roles. Now, the promise of women preachers really came about maybe about 100 years ago with the Pentecostal movement. And I'm not going to touch that. I'm going to leave that alone. His third wife was a Canaanite woman named uh, Keturah. And so my point is, in this Bible, is that all people, all, all people have the same access to God through Christ. Christ came to many uh, centers, his uh, sons and daughters, uh, his, pardon me, Abraham came through many centers. Uh, Christ came through many centers through Abraham. And Abraham's sons and daughters were both black and, I believe, white making a mixture of a mulatto uh, people. And God did it that way where the racist could not brag that he's mine. White man can't say Jesus is mine. Black man can't say Jesus is mine. But we are all one in Christ Jesus. How brilliant that is. How brilliant that was. How uh, 
majestic that was for God to do something like that. Now, Shem's descendants, um, they will eventually, not now, they will eventually carry out the will of God. I would guarantee that because the Bible says that they will. They're going to evangelize the world. They, not now because they're far from it. The Jew does not really believe in Christ now, but he will at one point or another. And so when uh, they do, uh, the gospel preached in the end of the world, the Jew will be there. Bow your head with me in a moment of prayer. Father, I pray that the race is recognized, that there's no superiority in anything. Flesh, flesh is flesh. Black flesh is black flesh, and white flesh is white flesh, and red flesh is red flesh, yellow flesh is yellow flesh. Help us on this earth to get along with one another. Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Now, uh, beloved, uh, I want to invite you to a spirit field of ministries. It is the end of your search for a friendly church, a Bible-preaching, Bible-believing church. And so I want you to come. Our doors are open in the morning. Get here about 9.30 or so. We have service at 10 o'clock. And every Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, we have a dynamic Bible study for you. So come on out. We are delighted to have you. And today, as you go to your church, uh, tell your pastor, shake his hand, hug him and tell him how glad you are to be in his presence and thank him for the many things he has done in your life. This is Pastor Wayne Becker for the Pastor's Corner saying so long until next week. God bless you richly.